Well, hi, everyone. Uh, it's me, Dr. Naveen Pemaraju, Professor of Leukemia at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, in the United States. I'm really honored to be able to join you on this exciting uh, MPN educational platform called MPN Hub, which I myself have been following very eagerly on social media. So, so congratulations to all involved here. Well, it's a really exciting time to meet to do this video because we just completed the ASH, American Society of Hematology meeting, our largest international meeting in all of hematology. Some 25,000 people approximately attended, and it includes stakeholders from around the world all over the heme space, classical or benign heme, malignant hematology, MPNs, leukemia, lymphoma, stem cell CAR T, hematopathologists, you name it, pediatricians, et cetera. Well, for our focus today on the MPN's myeloproliferative neoplasm, I really think it's the perfect time to talk about this issue as we close out 2023 and as we enter into 2024 with a lot of excitement and hope, and that is, what are some of the promising new drugs uh, in MPN therapy? And I'm proud to share with you all a message of hope and optimism as we enter the new year. I'd like to divide up my comments into three parts or three buckets, three categories. One will be those that are agents that are being successfully combined in the frontline setting with a JAK inhibitor. Then second, I'll discuss some agents that are being added into the JAK inhibitor, suboptimal or add-on approach. And then third, completely brand new novel approaches beyond JAK stat. And so number one, I think the top um, topics of ASH, uh, of which I was uh, a part of as well, was the buzzing discussion about the possibility and hope and excitement for frontline combination drugs in patients with myelofibrosis with a JAK inhibitor. And at the ASH meeting, several of these uh, were proposed and presented. One was uh, the one that I was involved in that I'm leading for full disclosure, which is the TRANSFORM-1 study. So TRANSFORM-1 is the combination of ruxolitinib with nevitoclax, a BCLXL novel agent, not yet FDA approved for any indication. And this was tested in a frontline setting, 252 patients with myelofibrosis, in a double-blind placebo-controlled phase three versus ruxolitinib plus placebo. So combination versus JAK inhibitor plus placebo. 252 patients, international global study, uh, largely enrolled during the pandemic. And what we found in that important study is that the primary endpoint was met. That was spleen volume reduction, 35 uh, at week 24, SVR 35, and it was double. The spleen size reduction was twice as much in the combination arm at the placebo-controlled ruxolitinib arm. The primary endpoint was met positive study. However, and importantly, as we discussed at ASH, the symptom change, TSS at week 24, the mean change was not, was not found to be statistically significant, uh, although both groups did have reduction in the symptom burden. And so because of that, the secondary, key secondary uh, endpoint was not statistically significant. So we discussed these results, what the meaning of this is, and uh, the study has a median follow-up of about 15 months at the time of the presentation. And so it's being followed still for more variables, including overall survival and, and analysis of key subgroups. So more on that study in the coming year. The second phase three important study was that of Palabrasib. So Palabrasib, a novel BET or bromodomain inhibitor, not yet approved for any indication, along with the backbone JAK inhibitor ruxolitinib. Again, another phase three randomized study against uh, ruxolitinib and placebo. And in this uh, large study, 400 plus patients, kind of similar results, if you'll allow, which is the primary endpoint was clearly met. Again, a doubling of the spleen size reduction, p-value highly statistically significant. But again, in the symptom burden score for all comers, all patients was not quite meeting the statistical significance marker. There was some subgroup analysis, key subgroup analysis on the majority of the patients who are intermediate risk. And in that subgroup, um, there was the significance of the symptom burden reduction. Uh, both of these are double oral combinations. The toxicities were as expected as we saw in the phase two studies, which include some hematologic and some GI. Um, and so both of these were presented. That was done by my colleague, um, Dr. Rajith Rumpel from Sloan Kettering. And then still a third combination, which is still earlier on, is that of Selenexor, which is an XPO1 inhibitor, again, added on to ruxolinib in the frontline setting. That one is still in the earlier stages of design, but again, in the early stages, only a few patients enrolled, very promising and encouraging results, again, in terms of spleen size reduction, and so larger studies are being planned. 
That was presented by my colleague, Dr. Sri uh, at Utah. So those are in the frontline combinations. As we move to the category two, which is that of add-on drugs, we've been hearing a lot about this approach. The nivitoclax and the plabrisib were also investigated in that setting. Other exciting drugs, such as the Cartos MDM2 inhibitor, uh, have been mentioned in this space as well with positive data in the earlier studies. So we want to continue to see how those studies unfold. The concept there is you're already on your JAK inhibitor. Most of these studies feature the ruxolitinib, the first in class, longest running JAK inhibitor. And then you add in the novel agent, the second agent, which is usually a non-JAK inhibitor. So we want to continue to see how that field uh, evolves, not only for chronic phase, but also for the accelerated blast phase where traditionally we've added agents such as hypermethylator or chemotherapy. And then a third category of interest to everyone out there is the exploding category in terms of uh, great research breakthroughs, which is novel agents. So these are completely beyond JAK inhibitors, and they include a lot of new categories. Uh, one is that of um, CalR targeting. So that is uh, the second most common mutation in the MPNs. It turns out that CalR may be amenable to immunotherapy approaches. So stay tuned for watching out for monoclonal antibodies, vaccines, bispecifics, maybe even CAR-T one day in the coming one to five years. So that's what folks are working on, the preclinical, and now getting ready for the first clinical studies to hopefully start as early as 2024. A second category here is looking at pathways beyond JAK-STAT that may be important in myelofibrosis, we mentioned earlier here the BCLXL and Broma Domain. Those have already made it in the front line. But there are a couple of studies that are pro proceeding forward in the relapse refractory setting. One is a metal stat, which is a novel telomerase inhibitor. That's a uh, randomized uh, phase three study with overall survival of the primary endpoint, randomizing after you've already had a JAK inhibitor to a metal stat versus best available therapy. So we eagerly await that study, particularly because the endpoint is overall survival, which I think is an important and possibly fantastic move in our field at marking the first time a major study has OS as the primary endpoint. I think it's something we need to watch carefully and maybe even model for future studies. And then a host of other pathways, uh, you know, beyond that, CD123, LSD1, uh, et cetera, that we're all a part of. I think in the novel agent category, the other activities that are going on are trying to look for targetable molecular mutations as we've done in AML and MDS, IDH mutations, FLIP3, et cetera. Also this concept of finding brand new pathways. So em emphasizing the importance of lab science, basic and translational science to just find brand new targets that could lead to drug development. And then a lot of folks are uh, have in-house programs where they're working on uh, discovering new pathways. I think another movement in our field is also this sort of mutant specific approach to targeting. So JAK2 mutant targeting uh, I envision will be something of importance in the field in the coming years. And then, as I mentioned, the CalR mutant specific targeting as well. So that represents a new aspect. So mutant targeting, immunotherapy, novel agents, repurposing of drugs from other disease states to our MPNs, and then, of course, discovery of brand new, completely brand new um, uh, targets. So I think I would like to pause there and just kind of summarize by saying that there's a lot of exciting research out there for our patients and families, largely uh, a complete sea change, I would say, in all of the good ways from just three years ago. And that's despite the COVID-19 pandemic. So congratulations to all the researchers uh, on our field who are collaborating together. And again, I would summarize by saying the focus post-ASH now is three clearly defined categories, frontline combination approaches, so JAK inhibitor plus novel agent from the diagnosis time. Number two, the suboptimal add-on approach. We're already on the JAK inhibitor, and then we put on the new agent. And then thirdly, the completely novel agents likely in the relapse refractory setting, but if effective, moved in the frontline setting, which can include but not limited to immune therapy approaches, mutant-specific, novel pathways, targeted pathways, and then the discovery of brand new pathways that we didn't even know about. So thank you so much for your time and attention, and I'm happy to stay in touch.